Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Endoscopy Conference, our first of the new year. Um, let's uh, go ahead and get started. We'll have uh, Jim Miller, one of our first year fellows, go ahead and present. Okay, let me share my screen. And can we, can you guys let me know if you see the PowerPoint or if you see the presenter slide? Uh, we see presenter view. Okay, that's what I thought. Let me try that again. How about now? That looks good. Okay, great. All right, so I'll start off with the first case. Um, so we have a 68 year old woman um, with a history of stage four diffuse large B cell lymphoma um, and uh, lung cancer. And she status both several cycles of, of chemotherapy, um, hypertension, COPD. She presents to the ED with one day of severe abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea. She's hemodynam hemodynamically stable, afebrile tender throughout her whole abdomen, but there's no rebound or guarding. And her initial labs um, include a hemoglobin of 12.9, um, which is her baseline and a white count of 30 um, with a baseline of, of a normal, uh, normal range, a B1 at 30, creatinine at 0.9 and a lactate of two. She ultimately got a CT and it showed marked wall thickening and hyper, uh, hyperemia of the descending and sigmoid colon compatible with colitis. So we were consulted for endoscopic evaluation and we ultimately did a flex sig uh, given kind of the localization of disease and kind of as we are entering into the rectum, the rectum as you can tell uh, is spared without any evidence of um, obvious disease. The distal sigmoid does have this linear ulceration in the longitudinal axis. And then the, the rest of the si distal sigmoid has kind of worsening of ulcerations now involving more of the mucosa. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of this, uh, kind of this endoscopically, this is pathognomonic to the disease process that we'll talk about. And this is called a single stripe sign. Um, and continuing our flex sig, the rest of the sigmoid, um, again, is, has worsening ulceration now involving the more uh, circumference of um, the colon. And then the, it involves the descending colon. Um, and we stop essentially at the, most ex, uh, the distal most extent of the disease. And so we didn't actually take biopsies because we have a high clinical suspicion of what this ultimately, um, what we ultimately call this, which is ischemic colitis or non-inclusive colonic ischemia. I know that we've talked about this, um, but I, you know, I think it's always a good thing to review. And so what is ischemic colitis? It's sudden and usually transient reduction in blood flow to the colon causing cellular met uh, metabolic dysfunction of colonocytes. Um, in most cases, no specific cause um, is identified. However, uh, there are risk factors, including cardiovascular disease, um, most notably uh, myocardial infarction and recent cabbage, um, diabetes, renal disease, and for and patients who are actually on, hypo, uh, on hemodia uh, hemodialysis, uh, thought, to, thought to be from dialysis-induced hypotension. Um, shock for obvious reasons um, due to the low flow state um, there actually have been reports of IBS um, being correlated uh, to ischemic colitis. And there have also been many reports on um, several culprits, um, such as constipation inducing medications like opioids, immunomodulators, such as anti TNFs, chemo, um, and illicit drugs such as cocaine. And extreme exercise can also be risk factors. Because as you can imagine, um, when there's intense exercise, there's uh, uh, shunting of the blood flow from the splenic um, circulation. Uh, it commonly affects the watershed areas, um, commonly the rectosigmoid junction and the um, splenic flexure. The left colon is mostly affected in about 75% of cases. The rectum is usually spared as it was in this uh, case. It usually affects about 5% of cases. 
And if you have isolated right colon colitis, um, ischemic colitis, that's usually associated with higher mortality rates. 90% uh, of patients are usually uh, greater than 60 years old. And I think it equally affects men and women. However, uh, there are poor outcomes um, in male patients. And then, uh, you know, the most common presentation most common presentation is mild abdominal cramping with an urgent desire to defecate. Here's some, those are some pills I did. I think there's... Their phones. Anything I should know about or... No, I know Tony was dealing with the patient portal. Yeah, what's happening with Sylvie? I think that might be... She's got to be fired. I don't know if I can mute him. If you have, give me her phone number, I'm going to call her later. Yeah, because Dr. Jaffin, respond, then it's good as not working. We need to know. Hey, Dr. Jaffin, can we have you mute your uh, phone or your computer? Thank you. Um, and so again, so sudden mild abdominal cramping with a sudden desire to defecate and passage of bright red blood rectum within 24 hours and often associated with bloody diarrhea. And so I briefly just wanted to contrast ischemic colitis with acute occlusive mesenteric ischemia because oftentimes I feel like we use them um, as like a, and I think these two terms are common misnomers and they're used interchangeably, although they're two distinct disease processes. And so mesenteric ischemia often affects the small bowel. It's usually occlusive from thromboemboli disease. It's usually very sudden um, and abdominal pain is out of proportion to physical exam and it requires urgent surgical uh, in intervention. Um, whereas ischemic colitis uh, mostly affects the colon. It's usually non-occlusive non due to low flow states, as I would mentioned, um, more gradual onset. And the abdominal pain is actually mild to moderate um, and oftentimes associated with bloody diarrhea. And the treatment is usually conservative as I'll describe further on. Um, and so I wanted to take this time to just go over the ACG clinical guidelines and how to manage um, colon ischemia. I, I feel like I've, I've seen uh, varying clinical practice. And so I think it's always nice to review um, what's actually out in the literature. And so the two things I want to focus on, I want to focus on are the role of imaging and colon, um, colonoscopy in the diagnosis of ischemic colitis, and then also how do we manage ischemic colitis based on disease process um, and disease uh, severity. And so CT is actually strongly recommended in terms of um, obtaining this when you have a very high suspicion for uh, colon ischemia. And the reason for that is, is that uh, the diagnosis can be very like, highly suggested based on CT findings um, with bowel wall thickening and edema. Um, and then, you know, at the very most um, can help risk stratify if findings, if you find um, you know, colonic pneumos, uh, pneumatosis or proto Porto mesenteric venous gas, um, then that can be suggestive of transmural colonic infarction, um, which obviously is a surgical um, indication. Early colonoscopy should be performed if ischemic colitis is um, suspected, and it should be performed in uh, 48 hours of presentation, and this is also a strong recommendation. Um, I've seen um, I've seen clinically, uh, you know, ha having a very high suspicion for ischemic colitis and uh, deferring colonoscopy um, and treating conservatively. But according to the ACG, we should be getting colonoscopies and mostly to kind of rule out other etiologies. Um, in patients with severe ischemic colitis, uh, CT should be used to evaluate the distribution of disease. And it's, um, it, can, it can be very helpful because um, an entire colonoscopy isn't necessary. Limited colonoscopy is appropriate um, to confirm the nature of CT abnormality. Similar to my case, we just did a flex seg um, and that can be stopped at the distal most extent um, of the disease. Biopsies uh, should be obtained, except in cases of gangrene. We actually did not obtain biopsies for my patient, but it is a strong recommendation according to the ACG. And then lastly, colonoscopy should not be performed if patients um, have any sign of acute peritonitis or reversible ischemic changes, such as gangrene or um, pneumatosis. These are all strong recommendations. And how do we manage ischemic colitis? Um, so th there are three strong recommendations. And so 
most cases actually are self-resolve and actually don't require any specific therapy. And these are usually mild cases. And I'll go over what mild uh, is defined as. For more severe um, scenarios requiring uh, surgical uh, requiring surgical intervention, um, uh, obviously these are this would be a strong recommendation if these patients have any evidence of shock, hypotension, tachycardia, abdominal pain without rectal bleeding is actually an indicator of poor uh, poor prognosis. Um, and again, an uh, isolated right-sided um, ischemic colitis or pain colitis actually is also um, an indicator of poor prognosis as well. And any presence of gangrene, um, all of these would require some surgical evaluation, consultation, and ultimately um, intervention. And then kind of the middle group, the moderate dis uh, moderate severity patients who I feel like we often see in, um, in our hospital setting um, often require um, antimicrobial therapy. And so ACG actually does recommend giving these patients antibiotics, and oftentimes that will end up being Cipro and Flagyl. And so how do we risk stratify these patients? And so if you look at this small table to the right, these are the recommendations that the ACG has in terms of what labs we should send if we have a strong clinical suspicion for ischemic colitis, and includes albumin, am uh, amylase, CBC, CMP, CK, lactate, and LDH. And obviously you wanna make sure um, the patient doesn't have infectious colitis because that would be a completely different um, uh, management. Um, and so we wanna make sure we get C. diff and a GI PCR to rule, to rule those out. And so how do we risk stratify? And so ACG divides up severity for, uh, between mild, moderate, and severe. Mild being um, so localized segmental disease seen on imaging uh, with other otherwise no risk factors that they uh, kind of noted in the moderate group. Um, and so for mild presentations, these patients can be observed, they can undergo supportive care with fluids and, you know, treating the underlying um, kind of underlying etiology for a low flow state. Uh, but the moderate severity group, which I think in majority of the patients that we will see, um, if they have three of three of any of these um, uh, factors, including male gender, hypotension, tachycardia, abdominal pain without rectal bleeding, BUN greater than 20, hemoglobin less than 12, LDH greater than 350, or sodium greater than uh, less than 136, um, white count greater than 15, and lastly, um, you know, moderate uh, ulceration seen on um, uh, seen endoscopically, if they have three of these, and actually they fit into this category, and do, they do recommend uh, at least getting surgery to evaluate to have them on board, and um, and kind of most importantly, providing them providing the patients with antibiotic therapy. And again, as I mentioned, if they're severe, um, you know, with which I think is actually more would obviously be more obvious with you know, peritonitis and gangrene, then that requires urgent surgical evaluation and ultimate treatment. And so my patient um, did kind of fall into the moderate category. Um, she had a high BUN, she did have a high white count that actually nicely went down quite rapidly with antibiotic initiation. And then um, she did have some uh, moderate um, ulceration seen on, um, seen on her flex sig. And so she ultimately did get five to seven days of ciproflagyl and ended up doing well and had no further episodes of rectal bleeding. Um, there is no uh, recommendation or any evidence that suggests that we need to do repeat endoscopic evaluation for these patients. All right, does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Jamila. Uh, good, great presentation, good uh, review. I, excellent pictures. Um, you know, that's about as classic a single striped stein as you're going to ever see, um, and you don't oh, you don't see that very often necessarily. So <clears throat> it's good to sort of uh, show that. Um, any thoughts from our viewers today? Um, I think the decision about and colonoscopy is always up for debate. If you kind of dig in through the meat of the guidelines, they sort of walk back that strong recommendation a little bit. Um, but uh, to me, that's that's the biggest point of controversy. Any anybody out there want to comment on whether like they like to scope these patients or not? Yeah, to me, if they're really if it's very classic and the symptoms are very mild, um, I'm not sure it actually adds very much. Particularly by the time we wind up seeing them, you know, people come in almost as they're starting to get better a lot, 
you know, they've had the crampy abdominal pain, maybe diarrhea. Um, and by the time they get through the ED and evaluated, you know, if they say like, I'm feeling better, um, I think you can actually just observe those people say this is classic ischemic colitis, but um, you know, everybody treats this a little bit differently. In your list of, um, of conditions, um, somehow you didn't single out atrial fibrillation. And I would just, um, you mentioned MI, but you didn't mention AFib. And I always think of AFib or new AFib as something that causes transient hypotension. Yeah, I'm of the notion it's only worth doing if you change your diagnosis. Um, yeah. And the differentiation between, you know, colonic ischemia and acute mesenteric ischemia is a big one. Um, it's probably, you know, something this group is very familiar with, but it's really important to teach the rest of the planet this because it really makes a big difference. I think to just add to what Dave said, um, you know, so mild disease, it may not be as helpful. The other extreme I've seen if someone's super sick on two or three pressors and their, uh, you know, their imaging shows signings suggestive of colitis and the entire clinical picture just suggests is colonic ischemia. Um, then in those cases, we often argue that the colonoscopy may not change management because these patients are not gonna be surgical candidates in their current state. Um, and so putting them through the, you know, the, an invasive procedure uh, perhaps may not be the best option. So in those cases also, we have refrained in the past. Great. Um, Ali, uh, let's uh, go on to your presentation. Sure. I was just gonna mention also, I think the antibiotics are an interesting point too, because the data behind it is all based on animal literature. Um, with bacterial translocation, it makes sense, but um, there's not that much actual data from people. But anyway, uh, I will start my presentation. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to tell you about a case which may be familiar to some people, um, but not familiar to all of you, and I'll tell you what happened and what the diagnosis ended up being. So briefly, this is a 35-year-old woman um, with lupus, complicated by lupus nephritis, who had a renal transplant um, in May of 2019. She's on um, Celsep and Belenicep, um, and she's presenting um, with dysphagia and dynophagia for several months. So she initially um, presented to an outside GI in August of 2019, um, and the outside GI performed an EGG, which showed an esophageal ulcer, um, and PATH was sort of negative for everything um, per what we got, and she was started on a PPI. She didn't get better, and so they rescoped her in September um, of the same year, and it showed persistent ulceration. Again, biopsies were negative per report. They continued on her on the PPI and then started her on care phase. And then I first met her in November, um, so several months later, um, who at the time when she was presenting with worsening of dinophagia and then also had dysphagia to solids rather than liquids and also weight loss and her BMI was down to 15. So I referred her for EGD. And uh, this is what we saw. And I'm at the basically the G junction and I'm gonna be coming back proximally. Um, and so you can see what we see. So you can see this really deep cratered ulceration um, and then there's more ulceration as we go proximally and it looks pretty awful. Um, and so this is just further. The video um, just shows us, you know, going and looking more. So we don't need to watch the whole video. So here's a representative image. So it's a large circumferential penetrating esophageal ulcer. And um, we took a bunch of biopsies, but all actually came back not so interesting. So obviously there is squamous mucosa with ulceration, but no viral inclusions. Fungus stain on the biopsies was negative. Immunostains were negative for all the common culprits. I took brushings and there was no malignant cells, um, but there were fungal um, organisms. So. Um, we started her on fluconazole, but we weren't sort of convinced, and we continued her on PPI and liquid caraphate. But she really didn't improve and continued to have weight loss. Um, we got an esophagram at this time, um, which is shown on the left, um, and you can see with my arrows, 
um, where the area of diseases in the mid to distal esophagus, um, and then also CT scan to see if there's anything beyond the esophagus and where it was going. And it just showed circumferential wall thickening um, and nothing sort of that was that useful at this time. So the question is what to do next. Does anybody want to say what they would have done? Ask them to do an electron microscopy on the, on the esophageal biopsy to look for HIV. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> A good mic that job. is not what we did. <laughs> that's, the, that's choice B. <laughs> so I I called Chris. <laughs> and it was like, that's hey, not a bad option either, by the way. <laughs> can you uh, can you uh, do something and tell me what's going on? <laughs> I'd actually seen this patient in liver transplant clinic, um, so um, so this is the first video um, that Chris took, and this is about m one month later than my initial scope. And it looks even worse. <laughs> it just looks horrific. So that's like one area of ulceration, areas of ulceration. And you can see sort of the tissue around the ulcers um, doesn't look normal. That's her stomach. What's your differential at this point? Are you asking me? Yeah, uh, Allie. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I was not convinced this was just uh, Candida. Um, and my biggest concern, which is why I kept on doing more testing, was for malignancy. Um, and specifically in her, I was very worried. Um, I mean, she did have a large hiatal hernia and actually, um, so there's, I mean, normal malignancies um, are, could be possible, like esophageal cancer, but um, I was thinking on the lines of something associated with their transplant, um, like PTLD, um, but, uh, or some opportunistic, opportunistic infection. So either is there CMV there that we missed? Um, that was sort of the other thing that I was entertaining, but I didn't think it was just Canada, and I think we needed to get a diagnosis. Any other thoughts from the group? Like, and see would be top of my list too. So maybe sometimes just getting a needle biopsy somewhere deep in there to get something that's not inflammatory. Although, so, you know, infection would certainly be, you know, I mean, infection's always the issue, right? Um, in these patients. And even though the first couple of sets of biopsies were negative, I mean, I think you're right to keep considering that too. And yeah, she was really suffering at this point, which is also the concern. I mean, she was kept on losing weight, um, really like severe pain every time she ate. So yeah, it was concerning. So Chris took a bunch of biopsies. Um, didn't take, I don't think you ended up needing a needle biopsy, but just took a lot of biopsies and just kept on biopsying deeper. Um, and we got a better diagnosis. Um, and this is what the path showed, which is quite interesting. So they showed Epstein-Barr virus positive B-cell lymphoid proliferation. Um, and they also showed evidence of Barrett's esophagus with um, metaplastic goblet cells. Um, and it was CMV positive. Um, and HSV and H the two HSVs and GMS were both negative. Allie, it says involving squamous mucosa and cardiac tissue. Do you mean like gastric cardia or heart? Gastric I know I took cardia. deep biopsies. I don't think they were that deep. <laughs> Whoops. I think there's an extra C there. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> you did not get the heart. It would be a first. <laughs> Probably the last. <laughs> so when I was looking at this, I was like, oh boy. <laughs> um, so the first part, when you're looking at um, EBV B cell proliferation, the first thing that comes to mind is PTLD. Um, and then we're also left with this CMV. So she was actually admitted because um, she was doing so poorly at this time. She was started on IV gain cyclovir um, and actually had some improvement in her symptoms. Um, but this is really treating the CMV part of it. Um, and she also was on PO gain cyclovir when she was discharged. 
But then to work up on the possible underlying PTLD, she underwent peripheral flow, which was negative. She got a CT abdomen pelvis in addition to the CT chest that she already had, which showed no adenopathy or other lesions. And then she also had a PET scan, which just showed the diffuse uptake in the min and distal esophagus, but no other hypermetabolic lesions. So basically at this point, we have an isolated lesion in the esophagus with um, this B cell proliferation that's associated with EBV. So I got our human um, and team involved and also we were closely talking with Dr. Delaney from the uh, renal transplant team. And what the diagnosis came down to was either EBV associated mucocutaneous ulceration versus PTLD, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. And I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, it's sort of a complicated uh, scenario and I'm dichotomizing them here, but they're all kind of part of a spectrum. And actually for PTLD, there's no formal definition. And um, some people in include benign etiologies into PTLD if they're um, B cell hyperproliferative states, although the more recent guidelines really just include neoplastic um, B cell hyperproliferative states. And so they're associated with EBV. There's often viremia. The prevalence of renal transplant patients is about 5%. Um, it's more common in cardiac and lung transplants because they're more highly immunosuppressed and it's more common in children. Um, and it's really a diverse presentation um, with greater than 70% extranodal. The treatment for PTLD is a reduction in immunosuppression, um, but it often re requires anti-B cell therapy like rituximab and or chemotherapy. Um, and then we move to EBV associated mucocutaneous ulcer. You can think of this as sort of like the beginning spectrum of B PTLD or sort of a benign part of the um, pathology. So EBV is associated, but there's rare viremia in these patients. It's really thought to be isolated to the mucosal or cutaneous site that it's involving. Um, and the pathology shows activated B cell phenotypes. And really the treatment is reduction in immunosuppression and you don't really need more if it's just this EBV associated mucocutaneous ulcer. So looking at our patient, um, she actually had a mild EBV viremia at the time. Um, the uh, viremia was 169 with a cutoff being around 49. So it's very, very low rate, uh, low amounts of viremia. And the path was consistent with activated B cells when um, they did the um, rest of the immunohistochemistry. Um, and so when you're looking at the literature, I mean, there's not <laughs> a ton of literature, but in general, um, they show that there's a favorable problem, prognosis if you just have this mucocutaneous ulcer. So the first um, series that I show here, um, there are seven patients with this disease, none had viremia and all resolved with a reduction of immunosuppression. On the bottom case series, they had 26 patients who are immunosuppressed for various reasons. So some of them were HIV, some of them were just old age. So obviously we can't change those, but six of the patients um, were on immunosuppressive medications and all of them resolved with reduction of immunosuppression again, suggesting a favorable prognosis. So what did we do? We decreased her immunosuppression. She was stopped on the Balanicep, she was stopped on MMF, and she was put on back on Tacro, which is what she was on initially in a little bit of prednisone. Her dynophagia resolved and she gained weight, um, but she did have ongoing dysphagia. So I referred her back to Chris. And this is, um, so this is in March now, so a couple months later. You can see that all the esophageal ulcerations are healed, but now that she has a significant stenosis, um, not allowing the scope to pass. So uh, Chris dilated it. Um, and we can skip some of the dilation um, just to see the rest of the tissue. Um, and so once it's dilated, he's able to pass it and get into the stomach. And you can see all the ulceration is healed. Um, which is great. So, and then um, she also got scoped again in um, August, again, some anesthesia. Um, and you can see the mucosa looks great compared to what it looked like before. Um, and she's you know, doing really well. Um, obviously we took repeat biopsies and they've all been negative. <laughs> 
So just to conclude, EBV mucocutaneous ulcers are on the spectrum of PTLD, but with a more indolent and benign course, it should be considered in patients that are immunosuppressed and have this osophageal ulcer and treatment is immunosuppression reduction and the prognosis is good. So that's all I got for you. Thank you. Allie, that's amazing. I don't know how you find these patients, but I'm glad that you do. Uh, <laughs> the, um, in the, the reports that you pulled up, are the ulcerations this dramatic? Uh, so they don't, they don't show any ulcerations that are quite this dramatic. Um, there is one case report that showed um, a very similar ulceration, um, but he ended up having, that patient in the case report, ended up having PTLD and requiring chemotherapy. Um, and it also was a renal transplant patient. So there is um, one case report that was like similar presentation, but ended up having a much more aggressive course. So. I think she was really lucky. I think she was on that border of turning into um, PTLD because there was some monoclonal prol proliferation on the biopsies. So I think, you know, but I think she, we caught her just in time before um, there was complete malignant transformation and she was just able to be treated with immunosuppression reduction. Allie, uh, thank you for presenting the follow up on this. It's awesome. Um, I, I don't, I, I may have missed it, but when you, is it, the reduction in immunosuppression a temporary uh, intervention or is it a permanent reduction? And in all those case series you presented, was there an incidence of uh, uh, you know, rejection in any of these patients? Is that a major concern or like, can you go back to their normal immunosuppression? So a lot of those are not, uh, you know, there's very few patients who are necessarily like, follow her perfectly as being a transplant patient. Some of these are just like, um, actually a lot of them are rheumatoid arthritis patients that were just on methotrexate. So they were able to just get off that. In transplant patients, um, there were some cases where it, they discussed that there was relapse of the ulcer um, when they increased the immunosuppression. Because the thing is we're not getting rid of EBV completely. Um, so that can be an issue. Um, for right now, you know, she has had a little bump in her creatinine, but it's been stable. She was actually initially just on Tacro and Pred, but then had to be on a stronger immunosuppression re regimen because of early rejection, which is why she was on this Lancep and everything else. Um, so definitely going to be complicated going forward with her, but she seems at least stable for now and not having issues. I mean, hopefully they have, I mean, she's so young. She's got her whole life ahead of her and this is gonna be a major balancing act. Uh, hopefully they come out with, you know, next generation immunosuppressants and, or treatments against, better treatments against EBV or something like that. It's, that's gonna yeah. be tough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought it was, even though I know it's gonna be a complicated case going forward, I think, you know, it's a really, uh, a little bit of feel good New Year's story about how well she did um, just with the little changes in her medications. Love it. Yeah, it's a pretty impressive story. Um, and the pictures are really good, but again, it goes, th those initial pictures really did look like infection, right? Of some sort, um, more like CMV, honestly, than anything else. But, um, but you know, finding the EBV is terrific. So you should add this to the literature because you can't find anything like this in the literature, um, but yeah. maybe, it will help somebody else in the future. All right, um, let's go on to our last presentation, Dr. Herter. All right. All right, today I have a case entitled Instagram Medicine. Uh, so the presentation is a 35 year old female she has a history of obesity and she had an intragastric balloon placement in the Dominican Republic. And the reason it's called Instagram medicine is she found this person on Instagram. We had two patients the same day who both had Dominican Republic Instagram balloon placements. Uh, and this was 14 months prior to her coming to our hospital, uh, presenting with abdominal pain, reflux, uh, nausea. She was still tolerating some liquids and having normal bowel function. On imaging, you can see on the left in this CT scan, uh, a very distended stomach. On the right, the balloon is seated in the antrum. Now, just for reference, because you're 
most people probably don't see a lot of balloon CTs. This is sort of a normal appearance of a gastric balloon. It is a little more distal in the stomach, seated sort of in the antrum, and there's all this like fluid and solid material behind it, but it can look like this even in a normal case that's not obstructed. Um, and contrast does pass beyond the balloon, so it's not a complete gastric outlet obstruction. But given that this balloon specifically was made to be removed after 12 months. She had the Orbera 365 uh, and it had been over that time and she was having obstructive symptoms. We made the decision to remove the balloon. So the first thing we encountered on endoscopy was uh, just a lot of gastric fluid, which is exactly what we expected because uh, the balloon is partially blocking the outlet of the stomach. This is the balloon itself. It is seated down in the antrum, and we couldn't maneuver the endoscope in a way to get around it, which also sort of implies maybe it was in a partially obstructed sort of position. So this is a catheter that comes with the balloon kit, and it's made to deflate the balloon. So you puncture the balloon with a needle, and then you push the catheter into the center of the balloon, remove the needle, and then the fluid just flows. You'll note there is methylene blue in the fluid. It's about 600 cc's of blue fluid. And the reason for the blue is that if the balloon prematurely ruptures, the patient will have a change in the color of their urine from the methylene blue. And so they'll know that it ruptured. Uh, it turns your urine greenish blue. Um, so the balloon deflates. It kind of turns into this balloon pancake. And then we use another tool that comes with the removal kit, which is this Viper forcep that grasps. And there's little hooks that you can see sink into the, the plastic there. And then the balloon is removed. Now, even though this is sort of technically simple looking, this is actually one of the more dangerous parts of the balloon, the whole balloon process, because during removal, it's very large and there's a lot of tension that can cause tearing. So this is the balloon outside the body. And then afterwards, you want to be sure to inspect and make sure there was no damage. So we don't see any gastric perforation. We can clearly document everything is patent. And we go through the pylorus. And then the, the main areas of risk are the G junction, which was clean in this case. And of course, the printer has decided to print. And uh, the upper esophagus here, there is a shallow mucosal tear. Uh, but nothing too serious. So after this balloon removal, she had immediate relief of her symptoms uh, and really no symptoms from that shallow tear. So learning points just about the intragastric balloon itself. It's primarily for patients who are obese, but maybe don't quite qualify for bariatric surgery. So this, a lot of patients are in the BMI 30 to 35 category who have tried lifestyle attempts and failed, but these patients might not be traditionally eligible for bariatric surgery. Patients with a BMI over 35 with comorbidities are eligible for bariatric surgery potentially, but not everyone wants bariatric surgery and this endoscopic solution is a little more appealing to some people. Contraindications are, you know, abnormal anatomy, bleeding disorders, pregnancy, uh, substance use disorders, severe liver disease, and there are a few options in the US right now. Uh, Orbera is the one that she had. Reshape has this dumbbell two balloon structure. And this is again, uh, another mechanism of preventing migration in the case of premature rupture. If one of the balloon ruptures, the other balloon will stay in the stomach. That's the idea with that one. And these are both liquid filled balloons. There's also a gas filled balloon that is ingested as a pill without endoscopy and the balloon is inflated with gas uh, after ingestion and three balloons are placed in the stomach. So the outcomes are pretty good with the balloon. Actually, it's a good option for weight loss uh, in patients who don't wanna have surgery. And there are many studies of it. I chose this randomized controlled trial, balloon versus lifestyle, and the outcome was total body weight loss. In this case, this was a six month balloon placement. And so you can see patients lost about 10% of their total body weight at six months. And the downside, as you would imagine with the balloon is once you remove the balloon, they can regain weight. And so uh, the red line you can see after six months starts to trend back up. 
but they still at 12 months maintained better weight loss than the lifestyle group. So it is semi-durable, but uh, not as durable as some of our other interventions. There are potential adverse events. Many patients immediately after placement because they have the balloon in their stomach, have nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, reflux, dyspepsia, constipation. All of these are usually treated symptomatically. In some cases, uh, they have to, balloon has to be removed because the symptoms are too severe. That's about 7% in some studies up to 15%. Serious adverse events are rare, but they there is the right risk of migration or the rupture and sort of migration and then distal obstruction happens in about 1% of patients. There's a very low risk, but a potential for gastric perforation, uh, ulcer, gastric outlet obstruction, which is sort of what we saw with this balloon. And then during removal, there's a risk of aspiration from all the fluid in the stomach. Uh, these patients need to be intubated during removal. There's a risk of esophageal tear, which we saw in this case, perforation or bleeding. And there's a very small chance of mortality this is cited a lot in the gastric balloon literature, but it, a lot of the cases of mortality were in the early studies and in more recent studies, there's uh, in some studies 0% mortality. So it's a little unclear if this was just sort of a learning curve problem with the balloon um, or if it's an ongoing problem. And that is it. Thanks, Nick. I, um, uh, so normally the balloon does live down in the antrum, right? Yeah. Um, so what is it that tips them over to obstruction? Like, is it just sort of just happens randomly or after a certain amount of time, it just sort of wedges into the pylorus? Do we so know? I think, you know, the main mechanism of obstruction would be rupture and migration. In this case, some of the patients, I don't, yeah, like you said, I'm not sure what it is that tips them over. It just gets somehow wedged in a position where not enough is getting past it and then they have vomiting because they always have sort of a degree of partial gastric obstruction that's sort of the goal of it and it's usually at the beginning in her case it was she felt fine for a while and then got worse and that was what tipped us over to you know remove it so that was her case I was in uh, brazil in rio the private practice group one of the most uh, frequent indications that they had for balloon placement was middle-aged women who wanted to lose some weight before their children's wedding. Um, and that was a big cause for balloons. And they would lose 10 to 15 pounds in three months and be very happy. The balloon would be taken out and uh, everyone would be pleased with the results. Yeah, so I, it's actually sort of a perfect use indication. I don't know uh, if every doctor would be comfortable for that exact indication without a, a strong obesity reason as well, but uh, it definitely works for short-term weight loss. I think a lot of bariatric endoscopists, um, the balloon is appealing to patients because, because it's temporary, um, but a lot of bariatric endoscopists like to offer another solution, which is the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, which has more weight loss and uh, more durable weight loss um, although it's a little bit of a more involved procedure, it's still not surgery. So that's another good endoscopic option. Do we know the status of, you know, none of this stuff is covered by insurance. Is that uh, on the horizon? As far as I know, as you said, at right now, none of the endoscopic bariatric procedures are covered by insurance. They're all cash only, which is why what is driving this medical tourism to the Dominican Republic, where it might be a little cheaper. I don't know when uh, we will have approval for any of this. All right, um, we are at the hour. So thank you, Nick.